good morning once again, everybody. I don't know about you, but I love seeing people go make a commitment to Jesus Christ and to be baptized as the Bible says. And so we, amen, come on, let's thank God for that. Um, we, uh, we still have an opportunity. If you've not been baptized, you can come back to the next service. Oh, you come about 20 minutes earlier, and we can get you baptized. And if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, that's what we're going to do. Hey, my name is Eric Gucci, by the way, if I haven't introduced myself. I'm the lead pastor here. And thank you so much for being our guest here today. And thank you for everyone that's watching wherever you're located. Just want to let you know, everybody, how much God loves you and how this is a place where we just want to get to know God together. And no one's better than anybody else. Without Jesus Christ, none of us could stand, not even for a millisecond. It's by God's grace that he saved us. I mean, it's almost like a ship is going down, and I was rescued off the ship, not because I'm a great person, but because God rescued me, and I jumped on that raft to get free. And listen, everybody, I've been saved, and God wants everyone to walk in his freedom. He's come to give us life, and a life abundantly. And abundant life, really, is so beyond what we offer in our culture today. In our culture today, it's about having enough money and having a nice home, maybe having a good job, have a family, retirement. All those are great, wonderful things. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came because he loves you and I. And he wants to have a relationship with you both now and forevermore. And the only way you and I can truly be free is when we are freely his. You're designed by God for God. And the moment we get rid of selfishness, is the moment we begin to really live. And that is giving our lives to Christ Jesus. I just want to encourage you with that today. And uh, this is what baptism is all about. And we're not a church of perfect people. We're a church that serves a perfect God. Amen. If you hang out here more than five minutes <laughs> and talk to me, you'll find out I'm pretty imperfect. So we're working together. And so we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is amazing teaching that Jesus gave. It's the longest discourse in the Bible that Jesus gave. It's absolutely amazing. It is so penetrating. He gets to the heart of everything, and we've been going through it through the weeks. And sometimes the Bible can be a bit distressing. Uh, some of the stories, like, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I don't know how to deal with that. And how many of you have ever said when you were growing up, I swear I'm at grandmother's grave. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth, right? We like to say we swear we do that. And why do we do that for? Because we want people to believe what we're saying. But the fact that we have to swear tells us that there's a problem with integrity. Well, in the Old Testament, in the old days, people would swear all the time. And they would make oaths, and they would keep their oaths. So, I mean, it was very, even my grandfather's time, he talked about how he used to leave his doors unlocked in his German village. He's from Germany, William Harkov. He'd leave his doors unlocked, and people would just, I mean, they'd leave their, they'd have a, a wagon. Of course, can you believe it? They didn't even have cars when he grew up. 1898. Can you imagine? And I had a chance to speak to that generation. And I also spoke to people that knew of the time of Abraham Lincoln. Yes, I'm not old. Okay, anyhow, so, so he talked about that and how a handshake meant something, right? And he didn't have all these lawyers. And I'm not against lawyers, but it, it used to mean that your word meant something. Even in America, even in our culture, if I shook your hand and said something, it was good as a written contract. Now, today, people say stuff all the time and they don't mean it. But there was a day, in the Old Testament in particular, where they would say something and they follow through. I want to show you a disturbing story of one of the most troublesome passages of Scripture in the Bible. And I'm gonna, the reason why I'm doing this, I'm going to show you, there's a reason why I'm showing this story. But you might be familiar with it, maybe you're not. I've been reading through the Bible in a year. Our church has been doing a lot of that together. And right now we're in the book of Judges, which is like the wild, wild west. Clint Eastwood belongs in this book of the Bible. I mean, it's bad. And what was going on is the Israelites were, uh, began to conquer the land with Joshua and Caleb. Joshua died. They had no leadership that was good. And every person did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, there is no, I'm going to do what I want, you're going to do what you want. And so they would raise them, they would uh, do well for a while, then they would get rich and do well, and they would fall away from God. God would let an oppressor come in, they'd cry out to God, God would raise up a deliverer. 
And this happened time in and time again, time in and time again. And this story is there's a gentleman by the name of Jephthah whose mother was a prostitute, and he was hated by his family, but the guy was a good warrior. So they were being, the Ammonites were coming against him. So what happened was God called him. They asked him to, to fight for them, and the Bible says that the Spirit of God was upon him. Pretty imperfect guy. I want to just show you the story, okay? So Jephthah, he made a vow to the Lord. That's what he said. Lord, if you indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, if you would do this, I swear to you, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it as a burnt offering. Okay, so he said Whatever comes out of my house. So what happens? He goes out, has victory, comes back from his battle. When Jephthah came back to his house at Mizpah, there were his daughter coming out to meet him with timbers like a tambourine and dancing. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes, which is a way of extreme grief. I'm so glad we don't do that today. I have no clothes. Okay. When he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you've given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. And so she asked to go away for a couple of months with her friends in the mountains where she agreed that she would not be a mother. And this is what happened after that period of time. And it was about at the end of two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man and it became a custom in Israel where they would mourn what happened. Now, some scholars say, and then what basically happened is she remained a virgin the rest of her life, and that didn't really happen. And other scholars believe that indeed this guy Jephthah did that because he was pretty twisted in his own mind. Of course, this would be illegal in the word of God. You should not kill anybody. It says that very clearly. Sacrifice was not correct. But in this day and age, people did whatever they were going to do. And they had false religious understanding. So what I, I believe, basically, most, a lot of scholars would believe, is that he actually burned his daughter as a sacrifice. Now, how can we follow a God like this? Right? I mean, come on. What's wrong with the Bible? Well, let me explain something to you. Just because the Bible reports something does not mean it endorses it. It's telling the story of how God intersected in a broken humanity, chose a small group of people, And through this imperfect people brought Jesus. So just because the Bible does not condone us at all. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because the vow meant something, and they broke the vow. Even with Daniel, when he was an older man, Darius liked Daniel, and he was fooled to kill Daniel. And so so they basically, he swore that if anyone did not bow down, then they would have to be thrown to the lion pit. Well, he found Daniel happen. He's like, oh, I didn't want that to happen. But he couldn't go back on his word. See, back in that day, didn't have written contracts like we do today. So their word was their oath. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. And I just want to show you that it's, oaths are important. But I want to show you what Jesus has to say. So we come to the Sermon on the Mount. I just want to show you how serious it was in those days. We come to the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is speaking to some, his disciples on the Sea of Galilee and the hillside. And hundreds and hundreds of people are gathering, and his disciples are there primarily. And he, what he's been doing, he said, uh, he's been saying this, but I say to you, do not swear at all, but let your yes be a yes, and your no be a no. Anything more of that is of the evil one. He says, do not swear. Now, part of the reason Jesus said that is because people like Jethro do not make vows. So there are people today that go into court of law, like, for example, people from the Quaker if you know what Quaker is, Quaker Oats, I'm, I'm not kidding around. That, that's, that's where it comes from. I'm, I'm not saying they look like that, but the Quakers, they don't believe, uh, they don't believe that, by the way, you know why they call them Quakers? Because when they felt the presence of the Lord, they would, they would quake. I'm not making this up. So if you have oatmeal and you start shaking, that's what's going on. 
But any kidding. But there are people out there today that will not swear on the Bible because the Bible says do not swear. Don't swear by anything. And, and we're going to look what this means because it does mean something. It, it does mean something. But I want to, first of all, read this passage and we're going to talk about it. But I say to you, do not swear at all, he goes. So, are we forbidden to make vows and promises? Well, let me just, let me just ask you guys a question. Can you imagine a moment in society where every political leader was expected not to keep their promises? I think we're there already, aren't we? <laughs> okay. Can you imagine a society where every business leader was expected not to honor their commitments if it wasn't for their self-interest? Can you imagine every academic institution was expected not to do what they say? Can you imagine every relationship and every marriage would be not expected to do what they say? What kind of society will we have? No society. There would be anarchy. There would be distress. There would be trouble unparalleled. Why? Because without promises, society falls apart. We need people to, to have promises. So without promises, it all falls apart. In our culture today, we're being told, ah, that's old-fashioned. Do what thou wilt. By the way, which is the first verse of the Satanic Bible. Do what thou wilt. So people do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter as long as you don't hurt anybody. That's, that's where they come from. But if everyone did what they wanted to do, what, what would it cost? Let me ask you a question. If you were going to go on a plane, I gave you a ticket. You can go to Hawaii. I'll give you a plane ticket there. But there's one caveat. There's a 50% chance that you're going to crash into the Pacific Ocean. How many of you go on that plane? <laughs> right, right. All right. How about this? You're forced to go on the plane. How would you be feeling on that plane? You're in that plane. You're like, There's a 50% chance this thing is going down. I'd have a parachute on. I'd have a life insurance policy of $7 million. I, I, I mean, I'd be freaking out, right? I'd, be, I'd have a lot of anxiety, and I'd be depressed. Well, you know the most prescribed medication in America today is antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. I'm not against people getting medical help. But when you have a society where no one's word means anything anymore, it creates anxiety. There's no stability. When we say we break the oaths of marriage, we're, and this is not about condemnation, this is about what's happening. And you don't know what someone's really saying. I mean, there's even pastors I listen to, I'm like, come on, that story can't be true. Not the vast story. I, you catch a goldfish, but time, if time you're, 10 years later, it's a shark. And, and so we don't believe anyone anymore, right? And so since we don't believe each other anymore, we have to, we have to kind of uh, pat our words. I swear by my mother's grave, this is true, right? Why do we do that for? Because our words don't have much meaning, so we swear to bring the ante up. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth. I swear in a stack of Bibles. This car is a great car. It's going to run today. Really, it's running? It's, it's a great car for right now. I'm telling you, it's a great car. It's going to run. Remember, we had a president. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on the president, but he said, it depends what you mean by the word is. Right? We parse things out. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. I, 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 I told you that I'd do it. And, we, and we, what do we do? We twist it to try to get out of it. And we try to find a loophole out of it. In sales, you can do this very often. You know, if you, buy this, if you buy this wheel package on the car, if you damage your wheels, we will either fix or replace it. What? <laughs> Nothing. I had a little something in my throat. And they'll tell you, and then you hit, then you hit your tire. And it's all oh, that doesn't be covered. You said it would. Well, I didn't, under these sets of circumstances, I said it would. If it was on the car at the dealer. You weren't on the car, you were not at the dealer. <laughs> I mean, they find ways to get through it, right? And so, is there any wonder why there's so much anxiety in culture? When, when I don't even know if my wife or, or, or is going to stay faithful to me. I don't know if you're going to keep your promises. I mean, this is what's going on today. Somehow, that's, that's Okay. Of course, the only thing we cannot do in America is you, you have to pay your taxes, of course. But everything else goes, right? So we're forbidden to make vows and promises in the Bible, and we can see part of why. And Jesus says, says this through the whole, the whole Sermon on the Mount. He says this, you have heard it that it was said. Notice, he doesn't say you have, it was written. He said, you've heard it said. In other words, the religious community of that day, this was the teaching that was going around. 
You've heard it say, but this is what I say. He sets the record straight. Some people think, well, he's annulling, he's, he's thwarting the Old Testament, and he's bringing a new law. No, he's not. He's actually going back and showing what the original intent was. Because if you go back and read the original intent, you see the original intent is there. So there's, there was two different schools of thought. There were the real strict uh, rabbis and teachers, and there were the more ones that just do whatever you want to do. So, and this is what Jesus had to say. I want to bring this back to us again, because we are a church that believes in the authority of the Word of God. Not public opinion, not what I feel, not what I think, not what I experience. But we build our lives on what the Word of God says. And this is what Jesus says. And I want to reiterate this because this is how we deal with life. I don't even want to talk about, what's your opinion about this? Uh, I don't have an opinion. The Bible says this. Why are you quoting the Bible? Because I believe in the Bible. I don't have an opinion. Opinion is my own thought. This is what the Word of God says, and I believe it. So, do not think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, to heaven and earth pass away, not one Jot or one tittle, by no means, no punctuation mark, will pass from the law. The word of God is forever and ever. God's word is perfect. It has no ending. Look what he says. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does not, whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I want to become great. This is why I'm doing this. Good idea. <laughs> For I say to you, and this part will blow you away, that unless the righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This would blow everyone's mind because these guys were so holy and amazing. And not all the Pharisees and not all the scribes were terrible, but a large percentage was. And they had it so figured out. Most people could not read or write. And they would do all sorts of things. He says, unless you're like them. What? Because Jesus is dealing with a surrendered heart. These guys did not have a surrendered heart. They used religion to get what they wanted. And I would beg you to consider, are we doing the same? No, not me. I know somebody else that would do it. You know, I've learned the longer I live, the, I trust myself less and I trust God's word more. The moment that you think, well, we are a cornerstone church, we're a Bible-believing church, and we're better than those other people, or we're spirit-filled, we believe in the gifts of the spirit, those people don't. We're spirit-filled. We're full gospel. No, we're, and, we, and we sit around, we strut our stuff, and we, you know what, everybody? If not for Jesus Christ, none of us could stand. It's just the way it is, everybody. I, I just, I don't know, I, don't, I, I tire Personally, I tire of people saying, this is the way to go. No, Jesus is the only way. And we got to get to the point and believe that Christ is the only way. And stop trying to think, one, listen, we, without Jesus, we're a wreck. I mean, the Apostle Paul said it. I'm a chief of sinners. And the longer I'm alive, the more I'm humbled because I realize how much I need God. And so that's what Jesus talks about here. So, We've been talking about, he's been dealing with these, you've heard it said, but I said, six statements. He kind of corrects the, uh, the, the, the interpretation of the law. We talk about anger. You've heard it said anger is like murder. If you hate your brother in your heart, you've murdered him. What? How about lust? If you lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Now I've heard someone come to me and said this to me, no one in this church. I said, Pastor, my, my husband looked at pornography. According to the scriptures, he committed adultery. Therefore, I can divorce him. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's taking the scriptures and twisting it to get what you want. What Jesus is talking about is everything begins in the heart. Everything begins here. If you solve the heart issues of your life, it will solve the hand issues of your life. It will solve what you do if your heart gets changed. And then today we're talking about vows and promises. And so there are people out there that think you should make no promises at all. But I'm telling you right now, without promises, without making promises, our society falls apart. Our church falls apart. And you and I should be people of promises. 
I thought we're not supposed to take oaths, okay? Let's look what Jesus has to say, and we're going to break it down today, okay? Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but I say, perform your oaths to the Lord, okay? But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, nor it's God's throne. Let me read that again. Again, you've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths. He's saying what people said. Okay, that's what he's quoting what was. And this is what he says now. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's, God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you can't even make one hair white or black. Well, we've changed that now, haven't we? But ultimately, you're just covering up what really is. So Jesus is right. Okay. But let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. For whatever's more than these is from the evil one. Okay? That's what he's saying here. So what are you saying here? Are you saying that we're supposed to now not swear by anything? Don't make any promises anymore? Is it wrong when you get married to give an oath and say, for better or for worse, I swear I will love this woman for the rest of my life? That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is, we're going to look at it in a few moments, even more, and, and, and dive into it. He's saying, if you have to use all these words, let your yes be a yes, let your no be a no. Stop twisting your words. And let God, you see, sin, this is what the truth of the matter is. Sin complicates your life. God's ways simplify your life. Jesus makes life extremely simple. Do you know people that you, you talk to them? How you doing? Fine. And you're like, and you walk away thinking, you go back, are you, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. Are you I'm doing great. I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy. And you walk away and you're wondering, what does a person mean? Because later on they get upset with you, right? And think about it. I mean, what makes, what makes relationships complicated is when people say one thing and they do another, right? When you don't know what they really mean. And you don't trust them anymore. They, they make you a promise and they break it. And so now you're, you're kind of anxious about the relationship. What do they really mean? And so Jesus, make, he says, just say yes. When you say yes, be truthful. Okay, don't swear. So, so I want to talk about vows. What were vows? Vows were encouraged in the Old Testament. What? Uh, hang on. We'll get through this in a few minutes. So Hebrews 6.13 says this. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. God made an oath. Okay? It says in Deuteronomy, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. There are, oath, there are times to take oaths. For example, when I got married to Sandra, I made an oath that I will, I will love and cherish this woman the rest of my life till death do us part. And I, I, I believe in that oath. And I will, with the Lord's help, do that. And so we, we take an oath. That's what makes it important, right? It's a contract. But Jesus said, hang on, hang on, okay? So Jesus even made oaths. But he's contradicting, no, he's not, hang on, okay? In Matthew 26, 63, he goes to the high priest. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest, when he's being tried, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you're Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. So Jesus didn't say, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't do oath. He said, under oath, I am the son of God. So even Jesus did it. Paul made oaths. Now I call upon God as my witness. That's it, right? That I am telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from severe rebuke. <laughs> okay? So here's things we can see about our vows. Vows were encouraged, yes, but vows were dis. What was discouraged was making a vow, swearing to do something, and then not doing it. That was, that was part of the problem. For example, the Bible says this in Deuteronomy. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. God takes our words seriously. So be careful what you say. And this is what the enemy would try to get us to do. God is a God that uses words to create. He's the one that makes promises. We're made in his image. Our words should matter. But if we say things and don't follow through, our words become weak. If our words become weak, then why would God honor our words if he can't trust us with our words? 
It, basically, if you're an electrician, you have low voltage type of electric, and people that do low voltage stuff like with a battery, like a little nine volt battery, then you have high voltage, right? And so in order to work with high voltage, you need to be certified. Many of us are so loose with our words that God won't certify us to use high voltage of his kingdom because it doesn't want us to get hurt. And this is what we see happening. So, and you shall swear by my name, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord, okay? So oath-taking is permitted, but it is not encouraged except for certain things. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? I'll tell you what he's talking about. What the Pharisees used to do is say this. They knew they could never swear by God. They wouldn't even use his name. But most people didn't know the word of God back in that day. So I swear by the temple. I swear on this. But don't swear on the gold of the temple because you'll be, you'll be content. That's what Jesus said. To That's what they would say. So they would swear on other things. Why? Because it gave him a loophole out. If I swear on the temple or I swear on my mother's grave, I can get out of it. But if I swear on the name of God, I could not. So what they would do, they would swear by the heavens. They'd swear by the earth. They would do all this. It was a way for them to wiggle out of doing the right thing and fool the people. That is deception. That is demonic. And we do the same thing today. So that's what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying don't make commitments. But when you make a commitment, God expects you to sustain that commitment. You see, it's the radical call to truthfulness. This is what God would have for us. We should be a people. It's okay to make vows. When you get married, uh, you get baptized, oh, that's fine. And it's basically, it was like a contract in that day. But they should be far and few between. What we should do instead is say yes or no. I mean, the fact that we say this, well, to be honest with you, let me tell you what's really going on. Well, the fact that you have to say, to be honest with you, infers... <laughs> that you're not honest. Why would you have to say that? You know people, you're like, if you, really, you don't know they're telling the truth. We should be a people that when we say something, we mean it. And let me, I know somebody in this church that breaks their vows too much and I'm really concerned about them. I'm gonna put them on the spot. This is somebody walking on the stage right now. Me. I do it. And the Lord's helping me with this one. Honey, I'll be home at five. It's no big deal. I get home at 7.30. Okay? This is a happy day in the Bucci household. All right? <laughs> but what am I doing? This is self-therapy, by the way. Thank you for my therapy. But seriously, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working on this because I realize that I need to be a man of my word because God's the God of his word. Well, what's the big deal? It is a big deal because well, I want to be a person where my words matter. So, and, and even complaining to the kids, put that away or you're going to lose your privilege. Put that away! I mean, why do you have to get there? Uh, Luke, my son Luke had a first grade teacher in his school, and it was the most mild mannered woman I ever saw. This little lady, I can't remember her name, but it's first grade. And, and these kids were wild. And she just go like this. It's like, what on earth is this woman has a power? Mrs. Sousa, there she is, Mrs. Sousa. She was an amazing first grade teacher. And she, she would, why? Because what she said, she did what she said. And so when you have to yell in the house, and it shows you're losing power. Why? Because you don't keep your word. So we're actually teaching our kids that our word doesn't matter. If we have to say it 10 times. So now I'm giving a little parenting lesson. If I say it once, I expect you to do this. If you do not do this, this will be the consequence. And then when it happens, you got to follow through. But the problem is you're angry with your kids, and you make these crazy punishments you can't really keep. You will never see your friends for the rest of your life. <laughs> So, let's be careful in what we say. Guys, we should, be, we should be people that people trust. It should be like it was in 1898 in Germany where you could walk through a village and you could leave your doors unlocked. That's the kind of people we should be. If I say something I'm going to do, I'm going to do something. Just the other day, this guy in Soldar Garage last year, and three times the cable broke. He's come out three times and he's fixed it without, without you know, paying for it, and without me paying extra. And he said, I'm really sorry. I said, no, I appreciate the fact, number one, we're all imperfect, but I'm, I'm very thankful that you're a man of your word and you did what you said you were gonna do. And he did. That's okay to make mistakes, but let's be truthful with our words, okay? Society cannot function without keeping our word. It cannot. 
all right? And be a person of your word. Don't swear anymore. Let your yes be a yes. Let your no be a no. Do you want to teach the young people? I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'll think about it. No, say no. No is a sentence. A complete sentence, by the way. How about this one? I'll be praying for you. Don't say that if you're not going to pray for somebody. How about this one? We have to have you over for dinner. I'll just end right there. <laughs> Book James says this. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and, and could also control ourselves in every other way. You see, the tongue, what we say. If we could control this, we control our lives. How many people are controlling your tongue completely? None of us are. We need God's help, and we need each other. We should be people where our yes is a yes and our no is a no. And if you don't know, say you don't know. Don't need to pad your resume. The longer the resume talks about you, the more lies there is. He's an international speaker, well regarded around the world. He has an international following. He has three people in Indonesia, and I have an, I have an office in Indonesia. And I, you know, if people do that, please, let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Neither by heaven, for it's God's. Nor by the earth, for it's his footstool. Nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be a yes, and your no, no. For whatever's more than these is from the evil one. What did the devil do in the garden? Did God really say you see, he wants us to twist our words. I want to make a, I want you to, to I, I, we're not going to be able to be perfect on this, excuse me, but we need to make a commitment with God's help to be men and women of our word. When people see you, that I trust him. And by the way, it takes time to build trust. When you flick the light switch on, it goes on. When you flick it off, it goes off. If you flick it on, it doesn't go on. And sometimes it does. You don't trust it anymore. But the more consistent you are on the small thing, let me just make it really, I've done this, by the way, too, by the way. I've caught myself. Well, let me tell you a story what happened. Oh, actually, actually, let me just say, actually, it happened this way. Do that. If you find yourself, because we all do it. We all do it. How come you didn't come to the party? Well, you know, I was really busy. My car broke. Actually, that's not really what happened. I, I think you're a jerk, and I want to hang out with you. No, no don't do that. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Truth without love is not biblical truth because truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. So when we tell the truth, it should be with love. I just tell it like it is. This does not give you a license to be abrasive and careless. We should read carefully how we speak the truth in love. What you did the other day, I found it offensive personally. And I just want to let you know that for me, I feel violated. Now, you may not realize that. Tell the truth. But do it in love. And do it when the person's ready to hear it. So listen, everybody, we can go on and on about this, but we need to move forward. Okay? Whoops, excuse me. So let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord, everyone in this room, and myself included, and those watching online, Father, all of us struggle with telling the truth. We realize that we have imperfect lips. We live in an imperfect world. And Father, even if we've called our name, even if we call ourselves believers, we desperately need you in our lives. Father, we pray that we be men and women whose words are true. Father, I pray that our yeses would be yeses. And our no's would be no's. Lord, I also pray that when we make a commitment to be married, we make a commitment to do various things and we take an oath, that we would take it seriously, Lord. That people would realize that our word is a bond and that our words are trusted. Father, we thank you that you are a good God. You're a loving God. You're a caring God. And Lord, I even stand here today recognizing I need help on this. 
Lord, let us be men and women of our word because you are a God of your word. And you said, be perfect as I am perfect. We thank you that you love us as we pursue you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up as we conclude here today. I just want to encourage you with that, everybody. I know it's simple, but it's really, it really is true. That's all we need to do is let our yes be a yes, our no be a no. Let's be truthful to each other and watch what God will do. I also need to be truthful with you. I need to tell you the truth. I need to tell you the only way we're right with God is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? If you haven't, you're in a collision course to a place called hell. It's not what you think it is. It's a lot worse. Hell is void of God's grace, of his love, of his forgiveness, of anything that's good, and it's eternal. And Jesus loves us so much that he came down to save us from a place called hell. He did not save you from having not enough money. He didn't save you so you could have a better life. No, he saved you from a place called hell. That's old-fashioned. No, it's not old-fashioned. It's the truth. And so I must speak the truth in love. If not for God, I could not stand here today. God rescued me, and he wants to rescue you. He's reaching out to you. And just because you believe in Jesus is not good enough. If there's a, I was saved, I was saved off a vessel that was crashing. And I jumped into the lifeboat. If the lifeboat comes to you and there's a hand reaching saying, come. No, I got this on my own. And so what Christ is doing today, he's reaching his hand out to you. He loves the world so much. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to faith. If you think God's an angry, vindictive God, you would not be alive right now. You'd be dead already. But because you're alive, because you're breathing, he's calling you to himself. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Let me ask you a question today, and it's an important question. I stand here today as a man that's been saved by the grace of God, not by my merit. But let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely know for sure you'd go to heaven with Jesus Christ? Or maybe you used to walk with God and you've walked away. And today you want to get right. You want to put God first in your life because he's not. And you want to surrender your life. If you want me to include you in a prayer in a few moments, I'm going to say a quick show of hands. Pastor, that's me. I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. I want to renew my commitment. Anyone today would be honest enough to say that. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anyone else to say? Okay. Now what you need to do is you need to grab a hold of Jesus. And the way you grab a hold of Jesus is by meaning this prayer with your heart. It's not the prayer, it's your heart. If you want to repeat after me in your heart, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. I choose to step out of control. I declare my life is no longer mine. It is yours. I give you my life completely in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray that you'd bless everyone that prayed that prayer right now. Father, I pray that your love would envelop them and they would know that you are loved by them and now they are your children and you desire to see them become the men and the women you call them to become in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you began a new life with Jesus Christ. And in the front pocket, there is a place to put there. I'm in a commitment today. I'm renewing my commitment. Or you can take your phone. You can text the following number that's up there. Text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And you can put it in the offering boxes as you leave here today, or you can text it. And we want to help you. We'll have people front here to pray with you people at the front desk. And by the way, if you need prayer for anything at all, not just for salvation, maybe you're going through a hard time, you need someone to pray with you. We have a prayer team up here that's willing to pray with you, also in the front desk if you want to hand these in. Before we leave today, I just want to give you another opportunity to give. Please put the slide up there. There's a, there's a slide. You can take your phone and you can do the QR code. There are four different ways you can give. You can go to Cornerstone Cheshire. 
you can uh, uh, text it, you can push pay, or there are boxes in the back. And let me just tell you what happens when we give. When we give, we get to change the world one life at a time from people right here to Acts 4, to Teen Challenge, to our missionaries in Indonesia, in India, to what's going on in Ukraine. All these things, we work together, together for good. And so I'm really encouraged that we get to make a difference together. And the Bible promises he'll meet all of your needs as you trust him with what he's entrusted you with. So let's pray. Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name. Pray you multiply it and use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Can you all stand just for a moment? I just want to speak a blessing over you before we go here today. And um, it's just a, a wonderful privilege and an honor to be able to be here today and to be able to share God's word with you. And so I wanted to just pray this scripture over you, to you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and bless the Lord.